Hello everyone, my name is Jay. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I currently serve part-time as the Asian American and Pacific Islander coordinator at Mass Cultural Council. Today, I will be your lead presenter along with my wonderful co-presenter, Sarah Glidden. She is the Mass Cultural Council's program manager of the cultural investment portfolio. Next slide. Hello folks, this is Sarah. I'm happy to be here with Jay today. Um, just to let you know, as we go through the program, if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A and I'll either be able to answer them in the Q&A or I will be able to voice them to the, the presenter, to Jay, and to let you know that um, we are recording the session today. The recording will be posted on our website afterwards. And we do have the program being transcribed automatically. So if you want to watch the transcribed text, you just need to pull up your, um, your operations pad there that uh, at the bottom of the screen, it'll show you the options and you can select show transcript and you'll be able to see the subtitles. So again, happy to have you here and also to welcome Tran. Okay, all right. So I would also like to introduce an inspiring Asian American creative herself, Tran Vu. She will be working closely with us as the BIPOC outreach coordinator. So if you have any questions during the entire grant process, please reach out to Tran, Sarah, or myself. Uh, next slide. Okay. Agenda. Okay, so never we into um, specifics of the grant. And as Sarah said, um, you may ask questions in the chat. Um, she will be assisting us with um, answering the questions in the chat as we go along with the webinar. So feel, please feel free to answer any, I mean, please feel free to put your questions in there. Um, so throughout this webinar, we will be covering um, how this grant was created uh, the goals of the grant, specifics of it, eligibility, what can and cannot be funded, the exact timeline of everything and the deadlines, uh, the application and review process, tips and suggestions, and also other grant opportunities at Mass Cultural Council. Next slide. Okay. Uh, so we'd like to take a moment to give a special shout out and express our gratitude to the Massachusetts Asian Caucus for collaborating with us to amplify API creatives in the arts and cultural sector who have been affected by the negative impacts of COVID-19 for advocating for this grant. Throughout the language of the legislative earmark, their goal is to provide pandemic recovery funds of 970,000 to entities that focus on one or more Asian ethnicity and conduct cultural events, cultural education, or cultural performances. Uh, these funds being prioritized are being prioritized to entities who have been adversely affected by COVID-19. Um, please also note that this is a COVID-19 recovery grant. So this grant is used to reimburse funds that your organization has already spent from July 1st of last year, 2021, or will spend by June 30th, 2022 of this year. The number of awards and award amounts will depend on the number of applicants and the needs demonstrated. Next slide. Okay, translations. Um, so beginning with the AAPI grant and all grants moving forward, Mass Cultural Council will be providing additional uh, translation services to all applicants. If you need immediate translations in Arabic, Chinese, Hindi, Khmer, Korean, Filipino, um, or Vietnamese, uh, Mass Cultural Council's website does have the Google Translate option um, on the top right corner of the website. You can kind of see it in this picture. If you do need additional translations beyond that, we are also able to create written translations of the program guidelines or the application. Or we can do live translations of, the of this webinar that we're doing today. We can do it again on a different date, 
or office hours with a new platform that we are piloting called Kudo. It's very similar to Zoom. It's not difficult to use. Um, we may requ you may request translation services by filling out the Google form on our website um, or emailing me directly. Uh, next slide. All right, so let's get into the eligibility. Um, so we'll go over the primary focus and eligibility of the grant. Applicants must meet all three of the following requirements. Um, so first, please note that only organizations may apply. Individuals are not eligible for this grant, unfortunately. Second, applicants must focus on one or more Asian or Pacific Islander ethnicity. Uh, and when we say focus, we mean the organization is led and run by AAPIs themselves and their nonprofit or their overall mission um, is focused on the AAPI community. And three, applicants must have been affected by the 2019 co um, COVID pandemic. And continuing on with the eligibility, next slide. Okay, and finally, the last part of the eligibility, I'll go over the three aspects of this grant. The applicants must conduct um, cultural events. So this includes uh, Asian or Pacific Islander holiday celebrations, such as Southeast Asian New Year, August Moon Festival, Lunar New Year, um, Diwali, et cetera, or commemorations. Uh, these events are have to be open to the public or, and they may be free, or you can charge admission for these events. Another one is the cultural education, includes training and or instruction in traditional Asian or Pacific Islander music, dance, martial arts, language, cooking, or any other artistic expression. And the last one is cultural performances. So this includes concerts, dance, theater, martial arts demonstrations, film showcase, and any other performing arts. Next slide. Okay, who can apply? Um, I'm sorry, um, this one, we're gonna go into the specifics of the three organizations that are eligible for this grant. Um, so these are the ones who can apply for this grant. Um, and we will go into more specifics of these three organizations over the next few slides. Um, so we may be able to answer the questions that are already popping up in, um, in the chat. So the first one um, is the highest priority is, our, is the nonprofit organizations. So these can be fully cultural or not. This could mean AAPI serving agencies that conduct programming that is also service-based organization and not just cultural. Um, the second one is unincorporated groups with a nonprofit objective. So this means any group that conducts cultural events, cultural education, or performances that do not have government status. Um, and the third one is incorporated for-profit entities. So this one is a little bit more, um, a little bit more specific, and we will get into that later on. So the for-profit entities must conduct cultural education and cultural events or performances that are available to the public with primarily cultural intent. Um, so the for-profit organizations must do two aspects of the education events or performances versus the nonprofits and unincorporated groups who only need to meet one of those aspects of the education events or performances. And again, this is not eligible for individuals. And let's get into the specifics. Next slide. Sorry, uh, am I on the right go, slide? Go back to the nonprofit one, one slide back. Yep, okay. Um, this is the right one. So the nonprofit eligibility includes organizations that focus on, again, one or more AAPI ethnicity and are primarily cultural. So this includes multidisciplinary arts organizations, performing arts or arts education, or they can be organizations that focus on one or more AAPI ethnicity that's not primarily cultural, but conduct some cultural events, education or performances, um, so this includes community centers, community business associations, 
organizations that support immigrant communities. Um, I think I did see someone in the chat um, ask you about senior centers. Um, they would be eligible for this so long as they meet the other requirements. Um, another one is religious organizations or groups with a religious affiliation. They're also eligible to apply for this if they produce um, or present cultural programming that is available to the general public. Um, the programming must be primarily cultural with intent and does not have an effect of advancing their religion on anyone uh, during their cultural events, performances, or education. Uh, the next slide, please. Okay, so unincorporated group eligibility. Uh, so the unincorporated groups, again, these are the ones that possibly do not have a government status. Um, these are the groups or associations with a nonprofit mission and are in the process of obtaining their nonprofit designation. These groups are only eligible if they have a fiscal agent or if um, they have they have a um, fiscal agent provided by Mass Cultural Council. And we can talk more about that later on. So the applicants using their own fiscal agent, they, the fiscal agents themselves must be a munici municipal entity or nonprofit entities incorporated in Massachusetts or registered as a foreign corporation doing business in Massachusetts. Um, but also please note that the fiscal agents, uh, they do not have to be AAPI based. We did get a question about that earlier. Um, they don't have to be um, AAPI based. Um, but if awarded a grant, the payment will go to the fiscal agent. Um, now for applicants using fiscal agent provided by Mass Cultural Council, um, we have, the agency has secured our own nonprofit organization to act as a fiscal agent for unincorporated groups that do not have a fiscal agent at the time of the application. Um, so don't fret, we can help you out. Um, and if awarded a grant, the payment will be made to that non-fiscal agent. Um, so if you're, if you're thinking of using a fiscal agent and you do not have your own, you are highly encouraged to please reach out to Sarah Tran or myself before you submit your application. We, were, we are here to help you out, so do not worry. Um, and a big, a big major key about the fiscal agent, please know that the fiscal agents cannot be the applicant. Um, and again, they do not need to be AAPI based. I just want, this is Sarah, I just wanted to clarify. Um, so if you do not have incorporated status, but you're acting as an organization, you can have your own fiscal agent, in which case you are still the applicant, but there will be a page in the application for you to tell us about who your fiscal agent is. And mm -hmm. we'll have the contract with them, but it will be reserved for your use. If you don't have a fiscal agent yet, we have arranged for an organization to act as your fiscal agent. You are still the applicant, but again, you'll check off the box that says you don't have a fiscal agent yet. And then again, we'll have a contract with the fiscal agent. We'll provide the funds to them. Then they provide the funds to you. Mm -hmm. Sarah's always got my back. <laughs> <laughs> Teamwork. <laughs> okay, let's go to uh, the next slide. Let's see. We're going to go over the for-profit eligibility. Okay, thank you. Okay, so finally, for the for-profit organizations, um, they, again, they are also eligible for this grant um, only if the for-profit entities conduct cultural education and cultural events or performances. Um, they can kind of mix it up. Um, and again, that's like open to the public and primarily cultural intent. So an example of this is if they're a for-profit organization and they provide like a Chinese language classes or dumpling cooking classes, and they host like a lion dance performance for the community, they are eligible. And then next slide. Yeah. 
timeline. Oh my God, we are zipping through this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the timeline. Um, so the application officially goes live today. So you all can take a look at the full um, specifics of the grant on our website. Um, so they go live today. The application deadline is March 23rd at tw um, 2022 of this year um, before midnight. So please note that, you know, we are here to help you. We can provide any questions and services that you need um, on March 23rd before 5 p.m. Um, after that, after uh, 5 p.m. on March 23rd, there's going to be very limited access for help. Um, as in, we will not always be answering emails. So if you have any questions, please get them in before March 23rd. Um, the award notification is April 13th of this year. Uh, expenses, again, this is very important. The expenses must take place between July 1st of last year, 2021, and this year, June 30th, 2022. Um, the contracts available uh, will, be, will be available on April 20th after the review process. Contracts due to Mass Cultural Council are May 13th, 2022. So please note that the money will not be in the organization's hands until April. And it really depends on how fast the organization can get the contracts to us. It takes about a month. Um, so please factor that in during the grant process. Um, and the final report is officially due on July 15th, 2022. Um, very important, if we do not receive this final report, unfortunately, the organization will not be eligible for any other grants at Mass Cultural Council. Um, and don't feel discouraged. The final report is very simple, very brief. Uh, if you have questions on it, we can certainly answer it. Uh, next slide. Okay, what can be funded? So please remember again that this is a COVID-19 recovery grant. So the grant is essentially used to reimburse funds that your organization has already spent or will spend by June 30th, 2022. I'm gonna keep repeating that. I sound very repetitive, but it's okay. Um, so a couple of examples of the operational expenses that this funding can be used for is payroll, your rent or mortgage, fees paid to artists, program expenses, marketing, um, or fundraising. And the next slide. Okay, what isn't eligible? So all this information is on our website. Um, you can always refer back to it. Um, if you have questions. Um, a few major key points about what isn't eligible. Um, so if an organization got a grant from another source to pay for expenses, this grant unfortunately cannot be used to reimburse them or any type of expenses. Um, Subgranting and regranting can also not be used for these funds. Um, and this grant is not for other folks. It's only for your organization's expenses. Sarah, did you wanna add anything about this one? No, I think uh, it's not unlike a lot of the other COVID related grant programs that have existed over the past year, year and a half. Um, this is really about your ongoing operating costs. Yeah, people costs, space costs but not, you know, not going out and buying a whole new set of computers or, you know, building a new wing on your building or replacing the air conditioning system. This is, this is more operating costs. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. All right, so the review criteria. So this is how applications will be reviewed and scored. Um, this also shows how Mass Cultural Councils and the Asian Caucuses priorities are for this grant. Um, so priority will obviously be given to AAPI led and run organizations. Um, priority will also be given to um, nonprofits and unincorporated applicants. So more over the for-profits. 
uh, priority will also be given to organizations that felt the greatest negative financial impact due to COVID. Um, and finally, priority will also be given to applicants that have had less access to other state and federal re COVID relief funds. Um, and also with the review cri criteria process, we really wanna highlight that we're not scoring applicants based on English proficiency. Um, so please don't let that be discouraging um, as you are going through the application process. Again, we're here to help you um, and in any way that we can, going back to the translation services, we can provide additional resources. So please take advantage of that. Uh, next slide. Okay, simple enough. Um, for the ones that are the grantee awardees. So we have three requirements. Um, the first one is to just please publicly acknowledge Mass Cultural Council funding. So this can include putting our logo um, on your website or a sign in your organization. Um, and also thank the Asian Caucus members as well for um, advocating for this grant. We would not be able to have this without them. Uh, the second one is comply with Mass Cultural Council's accessibility and non-discrimination policies and all of that specifics is on our website. Or if you have questions, please just shoot us an email. Um, and the final one is to submit your final and annual report. Uh, and again, you will not be able to apply for other grants if this final report is not submitted for this grant. And it will intentionally be as easy as we can make it. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, and I will turn it over to Sarah for the application process. Okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit from these slides and then I'm going to switch out and show you the grant application system live. So the full guidelines are on the Mass Cultural Council website. If you go to our regular homepage and click on organizations, it shows up as one of the first options under organizations. I think there's also a link from the homepage right now, or you can use that very long URL to get directly to it. And as Jay mentioned, the application is due by midnight on March 23rd. And we repeat this a lot because what happens is the system will actually shut down at midnight Eastern time. So you might think your watch is set a little differently. It's not gonna matter because it's the computerized system that shuts it down. And once it is shut down, we do not have the ability to reopen it for individual folks because it's part of our published guidelines. We need to be fair and consistent to all applicants. But really up until March 23rd, we, we really encourage you to reach out to us if you have questions, because we're here, we want you to be successful. But on March 23rd, you cannot expect that we're gonna be here after five o'clock. So really try to get this done earlier. So if you have questions, we can help you in advance. If you log in at 10 o'clock at night on the 23rd, expecting to get this done, we can't commit to having somebody available to support you in the process at that point. So Smart Simple is the name of the, um, the grants management system that we use. This is where all of our applications live now. And it's, it's fairly new to us. We've only started using it this past fall. So if you've applied to Mass Cultural Council you know, years ago, we're not gonna have your contact information in this system. But if you've applied recently, like this year on behalf of a festival, a festival grant, a local cultural council grant, or a project grant, um, all of those, you'll have a, a profile in the system. Also, if you are a grantee in our gateway projects or portfolio programs, you'll have a profile in this system. Also our youth reach organizations, because they've just gone through an application cycle, and if you've applied to the Cultural Facilities Fund, which just happened last month, all of those folks will have a profile in our system. If you haven't used any of those or you're brand new to working with Mass Cultural Council, you're going to need to start a new profile. And one thing that we encourage, if you've got, 
If you've got some sort of email blocker to keep you from getting spam and bravo to you if you do, I wish I had one. Um, you wanna be aware that when you are dealing with this application system, any kind of automated responses from it are going to come from this email address, masscultural underscore no reply at smartsimple.com. So if you have um, a permit list of emails that you are accepting emails from, make sure you put that in that permit list so you don't miss any, um, any communications from us through this system. Um, and just in response to a, a one of the questions in the chat, we are recording today. This recording is gonna be posted on our website. Also the slides from this presentation will be posted on our website. And again, continue will continue to be available to you to answer questions. So this is what the new system looks like when you log in. This is the, the, the welcome page. If you've already got a username and password, you can just go right ahead and log in. If you don't have a username and password yet, you want to click on this little, this little item here that says new to the system, question mark, register. Um, and that's gonna prompt you to start your app, to start creating a profile for your organization, which will let you get to the application. Your email address is going to be your username for your organization. And once you've, um, once you've clicked on this, you'll put your email in, it will prompt you through the process. The thing that is not intuitive is that you want to register as an organization. Yes, you are an individual person, but you are registering as an organization. You're gonna put your contact information in, and then there's going to be a drop down, um, a box where you can search for your organization and find out if it's already in our system, in which case you'll be able to link your name to that organization. And then that starts your application process. If we don't have the name of your organization in our database already, let's say somebody wrote a question about a senior center. We probably don't have your senior center in our database. So you'll just type in the legal name for your senior center. And we will verify the organization information. So sometimes that might take a day. Again, another reason why you don't wanna wait until the last minute, because if we have any questions about what your organization is or your eligibility, we wanna be able to answer it in advance as much as possible. So when once you've actually logged in, this is the dashboard that you're going to see. And you can tell that this is an account that I made that's not for a real organization, which is why it has the very elegant name of Sarah Glidden Fake. Um, but this is the dashboard. And where you see that first line of current opportunities, when you click on that, you'll see any grant programs that we currently have open for you to apply to. And you click on that and you can get to the application. If you've started an application, that second set of, of numbers on there underneath applications, you see the one on in progress, that's showing that I've actually started an application on this. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment so I can switch to another, um, another thing that I have open on my system. And here it is. So I'm hoping if the magic of Zoom has worked, that you are now seeing that same page, but it's the full screen, it's no longer in the PowerPoint. This is the live application. You're seeing six current opp opportunities exist. When I click on that, you can see the very first one here is the API COVID Recovery Program. And you would click Apply Now to start an application. But I already had an application started and it's here in progress. So if you start an application and then, oh, I am tired, I don't wanna do any more work on this today, and you close it down, when you come back, the application you started is going to be here in progress. Now, I'm opening up the application, but something I want you to know, um, when you start your application, the first thing it's going to do is take you to an eligibility quiz. And it's gonna ask you, is your organization, does it have a primary mission? 
focused on AAPI, arts, communities, et cetera, you'll click yes. Are you incorporated or not incorporated? You'll click yes or no. Um, just It's like five simple questions. You have to answer those before it takes you into the application. If, if you get an eligibility outcome that you're not eligible, it's probably that you answered one of those questions in a way that does not match the eligibility laid out in our guidelines. If you think that's wrong, that you should be eligible, don't take the computer system's word for it. Send Jay an email. She'll be able to find out why it was a no and help you get it to yes, if it should be. So here I am. I'm starting my new application. I know that small print. I'm going to see if I can make the print larger. Oh, look, like magic. So this is what the application looks like once you're in it. And a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. This area right here where it says notes, if you click on that, it will actually send a message directly to Jay about this program. So if you have a question about the application or a, you're trying to figure out how to answer something, you can do it in the notes. It will send her an email. She can come back to this. She can put a response in the notes that will send you an alert that your question's been answered. And then your whole communication will be saved here in the application system. So it's, it's a pretty nifty feature. We've actually been pretty darn happy with that. Um, other things. Here at the bottom of the screen, save draft and withdraw. Whenever you're finished, you want to save draft so it saves what you're working on so that when you walk away and come back again, it's all still there. If at some point in the process you decide you're not going to apply after all, you could click withdraw and that takes your application away. You won't get a response to it. It just withdraws you from the application pool. Um, I'm scrolling down just so you can see. It has places for information about this, this particular page is the information about you, the applicant. Contract manager is going to be who's going to be responsible for getting the contract. So you might be the person who submits the application, but somebody else in your organization actually deals with paperwork. You might want to put their information here as the contract manager. Maybe it's a financial person at your organization. If you're a small organization and maybe you're the board member or the volunteer who does applications, but somebody else has legal responsibility for signing and doing financial things, you might want to put their information there. The rest of these are tabs and they take you right through. I'm sorry, I'm in the project application here. So that's, that's not helpful. That's the kind of thing that happens. So I'm going to go back. I'm going back. Really? Okay. I'm going to go back to my dashboard. Here I am again under current opportunities. I'm going to apply now. Oh, look, here's the eligibility screen I told you about. So does your organization's primary mission programming and or practices explicitly and specifically reflect and serve one or more communities that self-identify as Asian or Pacific Islander? So somebody had put a question in the... Um, in the Q&A about what does the primary mean? Well, it really means that it's stated, either stated in your mission or it's really so obvious in your organization's practices that it's not a question. If you're just, let's say, let's say you are the Museum of Fine Arts and the Museum of Fine Arts has a really spectacular, in fact, several really spectacular Asian or Pacific Islander art collections. But there's really no way that you could say that the Museum of Fine Arts has a primary mission or primary programming or primary practices. So they would not be eligible. But for the sake of this application, I'm going to say, yes, my organization is eligible. And does your organization conduct cultural programming? And that's either events, education, or performances. Yes, my organization does that. Is my organization a for-profit? No, we are not. Is your organization a religious organization? In this case, no, we are not. And has your organization been adversely affected by the 2019 coronavirus pandemic? 
I know that feels like a ridiculous question because truly, who hasn't been affected by the pandemic? But this is one of the um, goals that's stated in the legislation that created the funding for this program. So it's a question we need to ask to be consistent with that language. Um, I guess it's possible. In fact, I have talked to a few organizations that really haven't found that it's affected their practices as much as they thought. They've been able to pivot and do programs entirely online. The work that they were already doing wasn't really in the public sphere the same way. We know it's not true for most folks. So go ahead and say, yes, you were affected. Save draft. I'm going to check eligibility. And now I can proceed. So it's not going to go past this page until I click proceed. And here I am now in the next step. Just like I showed you before when I was mistakenly in the projects application, we've got the applicant organization and its information. Again, the contract manager information, it's all there. The next page is the organization information. So this is where you're going to get into information that's actually about your application. And there's a couple of text boxes. They're not very long. In fact, you can tell they're only 500 characters. So that's, that's really a clue. We're not looking for you to provide lots and lots of information here. You just need to give us a statement that, that explains. For this first one, describe the specific Asian community or communities that your organization reflects and or serves and describe how the organization's mission, programs and or practices are designed to serve that community. So if you were um, a Lunar New Year Festival, you could describe that. If you are a music organization that is focused on a particular music tradition, you could explain that here. Then describe the cultural events education or performances that your organization produces. Again, it's only 500 characters, so you don't need to go into massive detail, but this could be, we do weekly classes on Japanese drumming. That's a perfectly fine and complete answer. You could say, we do weekly classes on Japanese drumming and three performances for the public a year, plus special appearances at festivals. That's more than enough information to answer that correctly. We want a website or a Facebook page, if that's how you communicate, that links us to your information. And then here's a set of questions where you check off all of the ones that uh, apply to you. And you might find that all of them apply to you or only some of them, but they're questions about whether or not you had to cancel performances in 2020. Were you able to do performances, but you couldn't do as many performances? Maybe you did them online. Maybe you were able to do them, but you couldn't do them for as large an audience. So again, you just, I think the questions are pretty straightforward. You just click off all the ones that are relevant to your situation. And then this is a really broad impact question. How has the COVID-19 pandemic affected your organization or group in recent years? And factor in other events that may have impacted you as well. So this could be, your response could be that because things were shut down, you couldn't do any of your programming, plus your executive director got sick. So that would be an additional event that impacted you. Perhaps this is about how hate in our communities has affected you and, and issues that are you know, larger and very difficult are also part of the impact your organization has felt. All of that, you know, just a very brief summary of the impact. The review criteria. So again, you just, you click just like tabs. Each one gives you a different set of questions. This one is about financial impact. So this is where we're gonna want numbers from you. Um, first of all, your total cultural program revenue for calendar year 2019. So this is setting a baseline for us to compare to 2020. If you're an organization that is not primarily cultural, maybe, again, the senior center, 
a lot of your work might not be cultural. It might be meals or um, support services for seniors in your community. Just look at the cultural activity you did and tell us the revenue and sponsorships that relate specifically to your cultural activity, not your charitable contributions, unless they are specific to that activity. If they are general um, contributions to support your organization, general grants that you get, they don't need to be there. If your organization is entirely a cultural organization, everything you do is about being a cultural organization, then this is all of your earned revenue and sponsorships. But if you're only partly cultural, not. The next line is for that same number, but for calendar 2020. So we can compare calendar 19 to calendar 20. You do not have to calculate the percentage change. The, the magical system will do that for us once you click save draft here at the bottom of the page. And then we also wanna know, did your organization have fixed facility costs that you couldn't scale back? So a lot of organizations had leases and they decided to stop renting space. They maybe moved to a virtual office. In that case, you were able to scale back your facility costs. But if you have a building that you own and you're still paying the mortgage and you're still paying the utilities, you couldn't scale that back. You were still stuck with that. So go ahead and click yes or no as is appropriate to you. Sarah. Yeah. We just have a question in the chat. Um, so regarding the application, um, Regina is asking, what if this is the first year of the program? How do applicants answer those questions? If it's the first year of the program, it would be hard to argue that you were impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. But if they have, if their organization overall is cultural, but they are hosting a new program, um, let's say it's- This new... isn't about a new program. This is about your organization or its cultural programming as a whole. Okay. Now, if you were doing cultural programming before and you're launching a new one this year, that's great. But we're still looking at you to compare 19 to 20. If you didn't have any cultural programming in 19, um, it's going to be hard for you to show that your cultural programming was impacted in this way. You can tell us in the narrative section, if you, if you think you're gonna make a case for it that way, you can definitely tell us that story, but we're not gonna have numbers to use as part of our um, calculation for grant amounts. And if you want to have a deeper question, it sounds like this might be a pretty unique situation for this particular applicant. So we can have a conversation you know, phone or email or Zoom and, and try to answer more complex questions for that particular applicant situation. I don't think that's going to be the typical situation for folks. Mm -hmm. I hope that helps. Um, we are looking to find out if you've gotten financial support from other COVID relief programs. So if you got PPP money, if you got a National Endowment for the Arts or Humanities grant, if you had earmarks from other, um, from other programs as part of the state government, um, did you get PPP money, the Payroll Protection Program money? Shuttered Venues was another federal grant program. Uh, Mass Cultural Council gave some cultural organization economic recovery grants. Mass Humanities, like I said, for our for-profit organizations, they might've gotten small business administration funds or other programs that we haven't itemized here, but if you've gotten support from other programs, check off the boxes as appropriate and then tell us the total dollar amounts that you got from those programs. If you didn't get any of those programs, you click off the first box here. We did not receive any Massachusetts or federal COVID relief funds and you put a zero here under the none. And again, it will do the calculation of percentages. And then the final question, organization leadership, is your organization Asian American or Pacific Islander led or run? And then the final page is you acknowledging that the information you've put into this application 
is your information, that it's true, that it's correct, and that you're responsible for the information that you have given to us. Obviously, you can't really sign the computerized system, so you click I agree. And then when you're finished, you click submit, and that sends the application to the system. You will get an automated email that will tell you, thank you, we have received your application. So if you don't get that automated email, there'd be a question about whether or not you clicked submit correctly. So I'm going to switch back to the, um, the PowerPoint because I have too many screens open. And so when you when we put the slides on the website, the slides are going to be these slides from the application process. So just a, a few thoughts for the sections that are text. I really suggest typing them in a word processing document and then copying and pasting them just because it can be um, difficult to type in those tiny little boxes. And I don't think that the spell check and editing functions are as easy to work with as they might be in Word. You can certainly type it right into the application, but I think you'll find it easier if you don't. Um, just ask you to read the questions carefully because a lot of times that the question that you might ask is actually embedded in the question we've asked you. If we're looking for 2019 cultural activity income, that really is the information we're looking for from you. Um, again, we're looking at 2019 numbers versus 2020. Just make sure that when you are calculating that, you're, you're looking at the right data of your own data before you put it in there. If you have questions, so a couple of things. First of all, send an email at any time. We, we are happy and, and willing and able to answer your questions. You don't have to wait until we do office hours to have a question answered. But we are doing these office hours and we found them to be pretty helpful and pretty successful for applicants for other programs. These are hour long sessions where you can sign up, you'll get a Zoom link, and really we'll basically sit in a chat space answering your questions and questions from other applicants. And what we found in other programs is that people learn a lot from hearing the questions that other applicants have. Frequently, everybody has the same question. So being able to answer it for you as a group is really helpful. Um, we've got three of these sessions scheduled, February 23rd, March 3rd, and March 10th, we're doing them at different times of the day because we know that different people are available at different times of the day. Um, we are also, our plan is to put these on Zoom, but if we get requests, we could definitely do these on the Kudo platform, which allows us to have translation services available. And if we get in, inquiries around that, we will definitely make that happen. Um, again, my friend Jay, Here's her email, send Jay questions. She will get back to you as soon as possible. And if you want to register for one of those info, for one of those um, office hours, it's on the AAPI program page of our website. And there'll be a link that takes you to the Zoom registration. So other questions, I'm gonna open up the chat box here to see what else is in here. Okay, let's see. Uh, question, okay, there's a great question here about are the funds used to cover revenues lost or operating costs during this time period? Um, we're looking at this really as the lost, the program is to um, help address the financial losses that organizations had. You will use the funds, if you're awarded a grant, you will use them to pay those expenses that we've said are the eligible expenses. And we know we're comparing 19 to 20 for the purpose of calculating the grant. 
you're now in fiscal 22, um, you're going to be using expenses from fiscal, sorry, you're going to be using expenses from fiscal 22 that you've probably already paid. You've already paid your rent for last July, August, September. You've already paid salaries, et cetera. That's okay. Consider this to be a reimbursement for you for those expenses that you've already paid for. The only thing is if you've gotten special grants or other COVID relief programs that identified specific expenses that you paid for with those relief funds, you can't use those same expenses again. You can only pay for something once. So we call that a duplication of benefits and that's not gonna be a possibility. Um, Jay, any other questions in there? That um, there is, so Seema, please forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Uh, they asked, do insurance and membership software count as fixed costs? I would say insurance and membership costs software are your ongoing operating expenses, and those would be eligible. Those are operating expenses for your organization. Those are eligible expenses. Mm -hmm. And then Nancy, are the funds used to cover revenues lost or operating costs during this time period? That and that's the one I just addressed, yeah. While you're thinking of other questions, let me just, just wanna tell you about other options coming up. First of all, if you're an organization that has festivals, our festivals grant application program is currently open. That application deadline is March 1st, and that's for festivals that happen between March 1st of 2022 through the end of August. You just go to our, app, our website, and same thing, if you click on organizations, under organizations, festivals is going to be one of the first options shown. And those are $1,500 grants. And we've been able to fund all of the eligible applications to that program in the past. So if you've got a festival happening, you are pretty much assured that we will be able to fund your festival. At least that's been the case and we hope it's the case going forward. Projects grants, these are grants of $2,500 for doing specific cultural programming. And things like the person who mentioned their senior center, if your senior center is doing cultural programs for seniors, you could apply to us for a projects grant. And that next application will be in June. And that's going to be for activities that take place between June 1st of 2022 through June 30th of 2023. So it's for the next fiscal year. Our local cultural council grants, those happen every year. They are for organizations all over the Commonwealth because the local cultural councils, there's 329 of them. Each one of them has funds to re-grant locally for cultural things happening in that community. Those applications are all due October 15th. So that's some months from now, but it'll be October before you know it. And then finally, a really interesting program of traditional artists apprenticeships. That program is just about to open. The application will be due sometime in March. I'm not giving you the specific dates because I don't know them and they were looking at a possible um, extension of this. But this is to compensate master artists of a particular discipline, traditional arts discipline, who are then passing that discipline on to a student. So this is to support both the student and the mentor to learn the skills and to keep those traditions alive. And on our traditional artists apprenticeships page, you'll see an amazing array of artists in all kinds of cultural disciplines of um, music and dance and uh, ceramic artists, all kinds of, of artists working to pass their cultural traditions on to the next generation. And it's a really wonderful program. If you, you, you yourself might not be that kind of artist, your organization might not do that kind of art, but if you know folks who are, we really um, encourage you to pass the word along. We are really, really happy to be able to support that kind of work going on. 
Any more questions that people had a chance to think of? Well, if not, uh, first of all, I want to just thank Jay for all the great work that she's done on developing this program and, and being a part of this program with us. And Tran, I know we didn't actually make you talk today, but I know you've been out there doing a lot of work connecting with organizations across the Commonwealth, and we really appreciate that work as well and look forward to your continued support.